Um, okay, so kind of start out. Good. No, oh, you know what? I didn't even check. Let's check over here. Oh, dang it, they're still not approved. Man, well, eventually we'll have our other emotes approved. Goodness. Close, dang it. <laughs> ah! Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm clicking wrong things. Okay, there we go. Uh, I am great. I slept in, so I'm still a little waking up phase. You can probably you can probably tell. That's okay. I'm okay with this. Um, okay. So we're going to jump in here. <laughs> uh, getting used to using an actual keyboard. Oh, you got... So you got... Did you get a keyboard and a mouse? Instead of like the the trackpad and, and everything then? Connected to your laptop? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I know you were struggling. Nice. That's that's really nice. That's so helpful. Oh my gosh. Um, well hopefully you love it. <laughs> I think you'll find that it's a lot easier than dealing with the trackpad and and the I mean, I don't mind the laptop keyboards, but man, they're they're scrunched together, so when you have a nice spaced out one, it gives you more room. You're not so cramped up while you're typing and doing stuff. Plus, that gives you more game options, too. I mean, we were talking about that with ESO. Trackpad is uh, kind of almost impossible with ESO, huh? Okay. So we're going to jump in here with a question. I have a game name. This is why I have them. Good. Yay. That's awesome. That's exciting. So here's a question. Do you tend to think of discipline from God in a beneficial way? Why or why not? If anybody wants to chime in and tell me what they think there. <laughs> do you tend to think of discipline from God in a beneficial way? Do you think it do you think the discipline from God is beneficial or do you think it just flat out sucks? Right? What do you guys think about discipline from God? course I think of discipline in a beneficial way <laughs> I, I'll tell you I could say the same thing but there's definitely been plenty of times that I did not think of it in a beneficial way you know I think it both sucks and is beneficial right? fair fair absolutely anybody else want to chime in there and why or why not why do you think it's beneficial or why do you think it sucks prompt you <laughs> yes it can suck for sure that's it at least feels like it sucks sometimes well I mean let's be honest when does it when does it not feel like it sucks like discipline in general just that's not something that we're naturally like I don't think we're wired to if we were if we naturally thought that discipline was like oh yeah discipline is great like then it wouldn't really be discipline because right discipline is to help correct behavior that you are not like basically willingly correcting on your own right so you kind of need that uncomfortable push hey you need to fix this right that's basically what discipline is so of course it's going to be uncomfortable of course it's not going to be pleasant you know uh, you know the whole growing pains thing where sometimes in order to grow we have to go through something that can be difficult but best in the long run yeah Absolutely. Well, think of you disciplining your kids. It's to shape them into a better person. So when we are disciplined by our Heavenly Father, you 100% know it's for our good. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. So here's what this says. God's discipline is often painful and never fun, but the brokenness it brings is necessary for change. In fact, one of the ways we know that God loves us as sons and daughters is because he is willing to exercise discipline it's like that concept of I love you enough to tell you no right I love you enough to correct your crappy behavior that's that's harmful right and I I like that it points out here too it says the brokenness it brings is necessary for change so it's saying like discipline is supposed to break your behavior basically right it's supposed to break those bad habits 
And I don't think I've ever really thought about it like that. So that's really interesting when you put it like that, right? One of the things that we say a lot is we're all broken, right? And that is kind of one of those weird, like, that kind of, that kind of fits, that kind of, you know, that makes sense. We are, our, our bad habits are broken when we get disciplined. Just like, like you said, with, our, with kids, you want to break their bad habits. Well, it's the same for us with, from God. God wants to break our bad habits so that we can be like put back together in a, in a good way, in the right way, right? My, my drill sergeants must have loved the heck out of me. <laughs> oh, I mean, they want you to live, right? They want you to, to, to be able to endure and persevere and, you know, all those things. So, I mean, yeah, they, it's a, it's definitely a certain kind of love there, I'd say. <laughs> oh, chapter verse. Gosh, I, I can't handle the noise that my glasses are making right now, rubbing on my headset, but I'm blind, so forgive me. Um, okay. So, yes, absolutely. So, so God's discipline is often painful and never fun. Like, discipline is not intended to be fun, right? Um, so what's the difference between discipline and punishment? And why is it important to recognize that there's a difference? What would you guys say is the dif difference between discipline and punishment? For me, I would say discipline is correction, right? A little bit of force given to correct a behavior. Punishment is you have not heeded the discipline and now you are you're in trouble like it is more of a f of uh you are in trouble you have not heeded the discipline you have not heeded the warnings and now you are going to reap some consequences for you not correcting your behavior right and it's important to recognize that discipline and punishment are not one and the same right I was a better soldier for it, though, and really appreciated them for it at the end. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. And I feel like it's also relevant to point out, like, the, the last three days we've talked about discipline. It's been more of, like, self-discipline, and now we're kind of switching gears into God's discipline, right? So we need to have self-discipline, but when we lack self-discipline, I feel like that's really where God's discipline comes in, Right? So we need self-discipline in the ways that God calls us to, right? And throughout scripture, it even tells us, like, be disciplined, like, have self-discipline. And and if we lack that self-discipline, then God's warnings and discipline come into place. And then when we don't heed his discipline, that's when the punishments come. That's when the consequences come. Because we are not, we are continuing to not make the corrections that are needed, Right? <clears throat> okay, so we're going to jump into Hebrews chapter 12 here. I'll read the first little bit. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, <laughs> oh my gosh, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. So, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> I swear, I'm still like in wake-up phase. My brain is not quite processing. Okay, so it says, 
The writer compares the Christian life to a long distance race. The runners, believers, find themselves surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses or the heroes of faithfulness. These witnesses are not heavenly spectators who observe the conduct of Christians, but those who have given testimony by their examples. Christians can run the race of life well only by laying aside any impediment that hinders one from putting forward his best effort. Sin, especially that of unbelief, also forms a crippling hindrance to good running. A distance race requires endurance, persistence, and sustained effort, not a short sprint. <clears throat> so I love the, um, the note says, Christians can run the race of life well only by laying aside any impediment that hinders one from putting forward his best effort. And that's absolutely where discipline comes in, right? Again, you can be self-disciplined to make sure that you are casting off whatever is, is hindering you from doing your best, right? But if we don't put it away, if we don't, if we don't get rid of the, the hindrances ourself, then God's going to come in and he's going to work on us and break those bad habits, right? He will discipline us to get rid of those bad habits so that we can then put our best foot forward. So when discipline comes in, think of it as getting rid of the hindrances from us doing our best. We are disciplined so that we can learn to put our best foot forward um, better and better every, all the time, right? Getting rid of those bad habits so that we are not hindered in that. And of course, sin, um, especially that of unbelief, also forms a crippling hindrance to good running. So sin is, is a crippling hindrance. We have, to, we have to put sin away, and if we're not, we will be disciplined, right? Um, and it says... The word for introduces the reason the Hebrew Christians were to fix their attention on Jesus. The term consider has the idea of weighing something for comparison. Readers were to compare Jesus' enduring hostility with the opposition they were experiencing. Jesus' enduring opposition should have inspired the Hebrews, um, the Hebrew Christians to renew their efforts and helped keep them from growing weary and losing heart. The writer contrasted Jesus' death to the reader's suffering. Evidently, they had experienced opposition without loss of life. So in other words, you can look at Jesus who endured immense, you know, um, hostility, discipline, opposition, you know, and, and he ended up giving up his life. And this is kind of a reminder that you haven't even had to endure that much. And Christ did. And you can look to Christ as the example. Right? Um, and it says again, Jesus Christ, the supreme example of endurance, is the finisher or perfecter in the sense that apart from him we can do nothing. He was even crucified in the most shameful way. Still he remained faithful because of the joy that was set before him. As a result of his faithful obedience, Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Believers who follow his example will also have a reward. So when we, when we heed the discipline and we, we endure that discipline and we allow that to um, break those bad habits and be transformed, right, and and put off the you know the those bad habits, the sin. Um, and we stay faithful to God and remember that the discipline is, it, it helps us grow in faithfulness, right? Trusting him that it is, it is good for us. Um, there's a, there's reward in that. There's absolutely reward in that. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, or the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Again, we, we opened up with this, right? God disciplines who he loves it is out of love that he disciplines us because he wants us to he wants to correct us so that we can we can 
be better, right? Um, like it, it said, you know, um, the brokenness it brings is necessary for change. We need to be changed. We need our bad behavior to be changed so that we can, um, we can, we can be better. We can be better examples of Christ. We can live as Christ better. <laughs> we can be more fruitful in the world around us with, with others. Um, we, we need that correction. And we need to remember that the discipline is for correction, right? Um, and it says, the writers remind his readers, the writer reminded his readers of an Old Testament exhortation um, of encouragement in Proverbs, which we actually read. I think we read that the other day. Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. Believers were not to view God's instruction or training as insignificant. They were not to grow weary when God reproved them because God punishes every son he receives. The idea is that in love, God allows or inflicts punishment on his people to discipline us. Others note, um, others note the Hebrew word behind discipline and disciplines as the ideas of correcting or reasoning. They see the verses as meaning that as a loving father reasons with and corrects his son, God uses difficulty and opposition to train or educate his children. Right? Um, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, you have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and, and live? So if we are, if we recognize, you know, our, our human earthly parents as disciplining us because they're, they're correcting us, they love us and they're trying to help fix our behavior, right? Then why would we not recognize God's discipline as that as well? Even more so. I think the discipline from God is a form of righteous love. Absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a note that I have here, we actually did a, um, a, a cer there was a sermon in my church on discipline several weeks ago. Some of the notes that I have are, you know, don't brush off discipline. Hold, hold yourself accountable. And like if you're a parent, hold your kids accountable, right? You, there needs to be accountability and, and discipline is part of that accountability. If, if you're not or your kids aren't um, correcting behavior on your own, then there needs to be outside discipline to help hold you accountable for that, right? Okay. Just checking my, checking my notes here. Okay. Um, Oh, and you know what? And and one thing too to point out is is the fact that discipline is instruction as well. So it's not just about you know correction, but it's about teaching you know what is not okay. Like if your behavior is not okay, then the discipline is teaching you this is not okay. You need to change this, right? So it's a teaching tool. It's an instruction tool. Okay. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I love that I love that you pointed out that it's a form of righteous love. And then here um, it flat out says, and this is actually our verse of the day, 
it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, right? Discipline is a training tool. We need to be trained by this discipline and through the discipline we we end up we end up bearing the fruit of of the spirit right and we we have more peace and we we are learning more about how to how to be better right through discipline we're learning we're changing we're growing um, we all need to be corrected so that we can hear god better and we can um bear better fruit we can be more like christ and Again, if we are not being self-disciplined in areas, then God is going to come in and, and discipline us so that we can see where we need to grow. And we need to have an open an open heart to that and not grudge the discipline, right? Um, okay. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees... Oh, hold on a second. And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. I love that. I'm going to read that one more time. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight, your path, the, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. That's like a... That's a really interesting kind of image of being disciplined and being corrected is like you're like imagine kind of being hunched over and you're kind of just gangly and 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 then God comes in and just you know like okay let's stand up straight right like posture and and heal your you know heal the broken bones and and you know fix fix your it says, uh, make straight paths for your feet. So you kind of, it's all crazy. And then, boop, nope, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to fix it. Right? Um, for healing. It says, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So then we can go from kind of uh, <laughs> dislocated. That's an interesting word to use, but dislocated, um, way of living right dislocated behavior to to heal that so that we can be on the right path and live in the right way said my parents didn't discipline me when i was a kid so it's something that i had to learn myself and it was really hard it's something that i wish they did so i think it's really incredible that the father does that to us i can totally relate to that <laughs> i was the kid that absolutely wanted my parents to to discipline me and i acted out so that they would and they never did so i absolutely figured a lot of that out myself too and you know, it's whether your parents disciplined you harshly or not at all, right? Like there or, or anywhere in between, there's still much to appreciate about God's discipline because you know that God's discipline is never wrong. I think that's probably one of the most valuable things that I've that I've learned is that God's discipline is never wrong. So even if like as a parent, I get it wrong sometimes, <laughs> I know that if I lean on God, and how he want how he disciplines me and how he wants me to discipline my child, right? I know that his instruction is never wrong. And I can't lean on my own understanding, but I can lean on God's understanding and I can I can trust that he is always right. You know? Even when it's painful. Ugh, which it is. <clears throat> See where we're at. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornication or profane person in like Esau. Esau, Esau, Esau I don't know word names. Uh, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when, we, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he, 
for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. <clears throat> uh, believers are cautioned to avoid any root of bitterness. Bitterness results from intense animosity or resentment. This bitter root bears bitter fruit, such as ill will, unresolved anger, jealousy, dissension, and immorality. A plant grows slowly, but what is in the root will definitely surface in time. Bitter bitterness may spring up in the heart of one individual, but if it is allowed to develop, it can have wide-ranging effects. The solution to bitterness and its consequences is forgiveness. Um, and remember, bitterness, that's bitterness towards... Maybe bitterness towards your parents, bitterness towards um, family, towards friends, towards enemies, right? Um, ill will, unresolved anger, jealousy, dissension, immorality. And that's towards yourself, towards others, and of course towards God as well. So if you've got any of that anywhere in your life, this is flat out telling you that that's going to take root. And that is going to have that is going to affect more than just you. If you let that continue to fester and grow, it's it's going to seep out and you're going to bear bitter fruit instead of good fruit through the spirit. So, if you're holding on to any of that, you know, anger, ill will, jealousy, dissension, immorality, bitterness, then you are you are not bearing that fruit of the spirit and you need to get rid of that be disciplined and get rid of that attitude, get rid of those feelings, give it to God, seek his forgiveness for holding on to those feelings and discipline yourself into correcting that behavior, right? Again, if you're not going to discipline yourself, God is going to discipline you to help you get rid of that, right? And that's, I think, I, I think when we, when we make the effort to discipline ourselves, I think it's probably, uh, it, it's usually a lot less painful and uncomfortable when we are the ones that are acknowledging and, and, and stepping into that first and we're taking those those nudges from God and not waiting for him to be the one to discipline us. You know what I mean? When, you, when you've waited so long and resisted so long that God has to step in and discipline you, that's when it gets real uncomfortable. <laughs> that's, that's when it really sucks. Um... It says, Esau was not spiritually minded, but rather a man concerned with material things. Um, profane suggests godless or unhallowed. Esau exemplified an immoral, godless person who had contempt for his spiritual privileges. So in other words, don't have contempt for God. <laughs> don't, you know, we, we need to be in a relationship with God and we need to honor and respect and obey the, in that relationship with God, right? And, and a huge part of that is heeding God's discipline and correction. <clears throat> that's, that's part of being, that's a huge part of being a follower of Christ, right? Is, is when we come into relationship with Christ, we open ourselves up to um, a relationship with the Father and the Son. And receiving the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will absolutely correct us and, and work in us. And we need to be open to his spirit actually changing us. And that absolutely will happen through, um, through discipline. And we need, to, we need to honor that. We need to obey that and, and let him transform us, right? Otherwise, what are we doing? Are you actually giving your life to God? Are you actually committing yourself to, to live as Christ if you are bitter towards his discipline? No. You're rejecting what he's calling you to do. You're being disobedient. And that's, we can't, we can't go down that road, right? Okay. <clears throat> For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more, For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. 
And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and tre trembling. But you have, come to the Mount Zion, you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, and heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all. To the spirits of just men had uh, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The mountain refers to Mount Sinai. It symbolizes the law, like God's law, the uh, sacrificial system, and the Aaronic priesthood. Everything associated with Judaism. By contrast, believers, quote, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The church is that city or homeland that patriarchs sought. The church is the general assembly of the firstborn. The church consists of the spirits of righteous persons made perfect in Christ. Christians can come to God, the judge of all, without fear because of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So... When we mess up, and, oh, I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'm going to be taking a little break right after our study, but I can probably hang out for a little while. After a bit, yeah. Just let me know when you're done. <clears throat> um, so Christians can come to God, the judge of all, without fear because of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So, we don't need to be afraid of the discipline. We don't need to be afraid of his judgment because Jesus is the mediator, right? Because of what Christ did for us, we can come to God without fear. And we don't need to be afraid of the discipline. Um, in fact, we absolutely should be grateful for the discipline, right? I apologize. I don't have my glasses on, like I said. Because they're making squeaky noises on my headset. <laughs> no worries. I'm blind. Alright. <clears throat> See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. As of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. I, I love that because that absolutely reminds me of, you know, when you have your foundation on Christ that foundation will not be shaken. You will not be shaken when you are when you really rest on Christ and rely on him and you're building your life on him. But what will be shaken is the things that are not of Christ, right? So when we are shaken by discipline, right? When we will all these bad things will be shaken away. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting kind of imagery there, but you know, everything that is of Christ will remain and the things that are not of Christ will be shaken away. That's a, that's definitely a an interesting way to think of to think of discipline, kind of just shaking away the bad stuff. Um, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God accept, acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire, and godly fear is like reverence and respect kind of fear it's not like being afraid <gasps> oh goodness <gasps> oh my goodness gracious the hiccups and then there was actually where is it a note here <clears throat> that I wanted to read in a second here um So discipline from God is not something that we should be bitter about. It's a really uncomfortable topic. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear about it. Nobody wants to receive it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. 
Um, but we need discipline in order to be better aligned with Christ. If we are not disciplined, then we will not we won't learn what's what we're doing wrong, right? We need to be corrected in order to make our path right and to, to be on the right path with God the way that God is is telling us to go. And when we go off and we, you know, veer off in the wrong direction, God will correct us and get us back in line. And that isn't that isn't a bad thing. That is because this is the way to the reward, right? The blessings we can receive through a disciplined, obedient relationship with God. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a gift. That's a blessing. That's not something to be bitter and upset about or to resent. And on the topic of resentment, this um, note here in my women's study Bible says, choosing resentment. Suffering does not automatically make a person stronger or better. The way you respond to suffering determines whether that hurt makes you better or bitter. <clears throat> God has provided his grace to soothe in times of hurting. Refusing that grace creates an inner environment where bitterness can grow. Every person at some point in their life experiences being wronged by another. They then choose either to forgive or to, or to dwell upon the wrongdoing until, until they become bitter. To be bitter is a choice to be faced by every person. When a root of bitterness springs up, it not only destroys her inner peace, but also can cause physical illness. Bitterness defiles all those it touches, starting with the one who is bitter, but extending to other relationships. Furthermore, the one embittered becomes enslaved to the person toward whom that bitterness is directed. Ooh. Ruth is a prime example of one who refused bitterness. She lost her, fam or her familiar homeland, her language, the religion in which she had been reared, the freedoms of citizenship, and the familiar, familial network in which she had lived all her life. She made new commitments, assumed new responsibilities, and that within a land in which she was considered an alien and enemy. Yet her faith enabled her to move forward against overwhelming adversity, and thus to experience the amazing providence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Ruth paid a great price. She did indeed suffer hurt and hardship, but she was rewarded for her faithfulness by being part of the lineage of the Messiah. Naomi, on the other hand, returned to the familiar land and people, and once again found herself under the protection of Yahweh. She did lose a husband and two sons, but she gained an incomparable daughter-in-law. Those loving devotion became... Oh, whose loving devotion became a model unto the generations. She went through a cycle of bitterness, but through her faith, Naomi was cleansed from bitterness and restored to a right relationship with the Lord and others. She too experienced again joy and usefulness as she looked beyond her circumstances and said no to bitterness and yes to God's sovereign grace and plan for her life. Uh, bitterness can have far-reaching, long-lasting, and self-destructive effects. A bitter person must first turn to Christ. Once they have accepted his forgiveness, then, um, then they are not only able, but also commanded to forgive others. One very practical way to do that is to replace bitterness with love, especially by showing love to the one who has wronged them. Again, man, we're called to love our enemies. I love that, though. That's that's a really good reminder that if you're feeling bitter towards somebody, the best way to get past that bitterness is to to intentionally love, right? Be disciplined in that. That is absolutely something that takes discipline is loving people that have wronged you. And it's hard to do, right? That's not, let's be honest, like that's not in our nature to love people who are mean to us. But as you become disciplined in your relationship with Christ, you become disciplined in spending time in his word and prayer, like we talked about yesterday, right? It becomes more natural for you to just pour out love towards everybody. No matter if they are cruel and unkind or they're also, you know, loving towards you. Whatever the case is, no matter how somebody acts towards you, uh, being bitter 
is is never the right way. It's never helpful. It's never healthy. And just purposefully, intentionally loving people through their brokenness is absolutely always the right way. Always the right way. And again, as we become more disciplined in our time with God and disciplined in that relationship so that we are we are more disciplined about constantly seeking him out first in all things, right? No matter what decision you're trying to make, no matter what life is throwing at you, no matter what it is, if you are seeking God out and disciplining yourself to seek God out in every single thing, then it will become a lot easier to take on that discipline and correction without bitterness. But it takes it takes self-discipline in that relationship, in your personal relationship with God in order for you to kick out bitterness, don't leave any room for that, and just constantly just be pouring out love intentionally. If that's a choice. Love is a choice. It is a conscious choice. But the more that you are disciplined in that, the easier it becomes and the more fruitful it is for you and for those around you. Just like the more bitter you feel, the less fruitful it is for those around you, right? It's damaging. Bitterness is very damaging. So don't be bitter towards God about the discipline. Be appreciative for the discipline and the correction and take it and bear it with love. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Drink some coffee. Welcome, welcome. How are you today? We are in a very um, fun topic of discipline today. <laughs> So, and hello, Yoshi. Good morning. I am very well. Thank you for asking. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for popping in. Um, we have been reading through Hebrews chapter 12, and I was just going through a um, section of, um, of notes in my study Bible and referencing some of the ones that I have through this awesome study tool I've got. And Yoshi said, the Hebrews verse reminds me of Proverbs 3, 6, which says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Absolutely. How's he going to make straight your path if he's not correcting you? You know, we have to take the correction. Discipline is an instruction tool. It is correction, right? And we have to take it as it is and not be bitter about it. So... Um, are there any, other, any, blah, 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 any other verses that you guys think of offhand that um, that that you think of when we read through this? Talk about this. Favorite animal. It's an interesting question. Why why are we asking about animals? <laughs> Um, oh, you know, another thing, too, with, with the topic of discipline. Um, so when we, when we choose to be bitter about the discipline, um, that, is, it, that, in a way, is being irresponsible with the instructions that God has given us, right? So even when it's, when it's discipline from God to ourselves or us to our kids, um, when we are irresponsible, when we react in an irresponsible way with that discipline, towards that discipline, um, our irresponsibility eventually becomes somebody else's responsibility. So if we are not being responsible in correcting our behavior, there's not just going to be consequences for us. Just like we're talking about bitterness kind of feeds out. It, it's exactly that, is that it's not only affecting you it's not only impacting you and giving you negative consequences when when you are not responsible with that discipline it's it's impacting other people as well in a negative way so and, and also you know when God corrects us it is so we can bear more fruit and we can share the truth and be more like Christ um, even better towards others, right? We can be a better example towards others, uh, be more loving towards others, and be
be able to share the truth even better, even stronger um, than, than before we took that correction. But we need to, we need to have that correction. Reminds me of actually, um, let's see, what was the verse? Reminds me of our verse of the day from Tuesday, which is, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Goes back to, you know, that self-discipline so that we can, we can then be better equipped to go out into the world and bear fruit, right? And when we are self-disciplined, there's less discipline that we need from God. But when we're not self-disciplined enough in some areas, God's going to step in and discipline. We need this, we need the correction and we need to be so disciplined in our relationship with God that it is, it is our desire to be, to just always be correcting ourselves and make sure that we're lining up with God and how he wants us to live our life, right? So we don't want our um, bitterness or um, contempt for God's correction or lack of self-discipline to end up negatively impacting um, other people or accidentally steer somebody away from God because we are lacking discipline, right? That's not being a good example and that's not bearing the fruit of the spirit. That's not bearing good fruit. That's bearing bad fruit. That's being a terrible example. So. Anybody have anything else on our topic to chime in there? I'll check our notes here, see if there's anything else we have missed. And I will admit, we 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 really we try to stay on topic for our for our studies, so I don't tend to go off script um, for our study time. Let's see. When we find things not going the way we should, we often think it's evidence of God's anger or absence. But this passage remind, reminds us that when God disciplines us, it's actually evidence of his love. He loves us too much to allow us to go our own way unchallenged. Welcome back, Johnny. I love that. He loves us too much to allow us to go our own way unchallenged. Remember, there's a difference between punishment and discipline. And God is not punishing you just because he's correcting you, right? Um, now, if you don't heed the discipline, then that's when punishment very well could come, right? But that looks different and feels different than the discipline. Discipline is a teaching tool to correct our behavior, and it's because he loves us. I love this. He loves us too much to allow us to go our own way unchallenged. So he doesn't want you to go off in the brambles. He wants you to stay on his path and allow him to guide you so that you can walk towards that prize, walk towards that reward, stay on the right racetrack, you know, and not, and not veer off on the wrong way. Um... Here's a good question. What are some things you might depend on other than God? Ooh. Are there things that you depend on other than God? I tell you, it makes me think of, um, <laughs> I think I've told you guys before my, uh, about my coffee fasting. I know that sounds silly, but, um, like Lent last, this last Lent week, all decided to give up something and I felt God telling me you're gonna give up coffee and I was like no I don't want to but I gave up coffee for um, I think it was two weeks and I really felt like God was telling me hey you are relying on your coffee more than you're relying on me like you're more grateful for your coffee in the morning than you are for me waking you up and giving you another day you know, and it was like really a, kind of a slap in the face for me. Like, dang, I've been putting a lot of, you know, gratitude and, and, and you know, power into my coffee instead of like really recognizing it's God that gets me up in the morning. 
it's God that, that pulls me through my day, that feeds me, that fuels me. You know, the coffee is an extra little blessing, right? But it's not what I should be relying on to get my day started. I need to rely on God to get my day started, right? And that's where our, that's, that's actually where our um, title and everything came from, is morning brew is not about coffee, right? It's start every day brewing over the word of God. So it's kind of a wordplay for me to like get my mind more focused on spend time with God, rely on God to get my day going, not my coffee. And don't get me wrong. I love my coffee. And I feel like once I finally realize that, like <laughs> I feel less, um, <gasps> ow, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I feel less attached, I guess, to my coffee. <gasps> oh my goodness. Less reliant on my coffee. You know what I mean? Um, but I feel like I also enjoy it so much more because I recognize that it's just, it's, it's an added little blessing, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not the driving tool of my morning. <laughs> Let's see. The food for you, you rely on food. Yeah. Fasting really helps remind me that I need to rely on God. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I actually did a, a random blog post on fasting after after that coffee fast. And I was like, I was just so encouraged by that. I've fasted plenty of times in the past, but that one was like, okay, God, I understand now. Like, I understand what the purpose of fasting is. Fasting is a great disciplinary tool. Not going to lie. It's, it's great. You're disciplining yourself to, you know refrain from something that you're maybe a little too attached to right and 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 give it to god make it right with god and um and give your focus back to god and fasting is absolutely something that should be done in honor of god um so that you can be made right with him you know it's it's an incredible tool it really is i encourage everybody to if there's something that you're feeling oh, maybe i'm a little too uh too reliant on this Pray over uh, if fasting might be a good good thing for you to do. So, um, anything else that maybe you think you rely on other than God? Let's see. Okay, so... And how have you seen, so on that question too, how have you seen God use discipline to remind you that you are dependent on him and not those things? Fasting isn't fun, but I've had revelations in God's word while doing it. Absolutely, dude, for sure. For sure. That's funny. You kind of answered the question before I even asked it. Anybody else? Anybody else want to chime in as well? So here's some things that maybe you rely on or depend on. And how has God disciplined you to remind you not to depend on those things? Even if you don't want to answer it here, you know, I think that those are really good questions, kind of heart check questions. You know what I mean? Um, we, we, I think that's a, that's a term that I use a lot, but that's a heart check question. Kind of need to check in with yourself, check in with God, check your heart according to God, right? And God, give me a clean heart, right? Am I relying on something else more than I'm relying on you? Or is something else, you know, taking more of my focus than, you know, that I need to be giving to you? We need to be, we need to be checking ourselves on that. <laughs> I rely on the internet. Yeah. You know, especially like we're, we're here on Twitch, right? Um, we're using the internet. Uh Gaming is something that I know people rely heavily, heavily on, especially right now during the pandemic. People are relying on gaming to like help them keep their sanity. You know what I mean? Like I hear that a lot. Like this is my this is my ultimate stress relief. I am using this as a distraction. This is so that I don't lose my mind while I'm trapped inside or while everything's crazy, right? Welcome, welcome. Cinnamon the bagel. That's adorable. <laughs> Goes perfect with coffee, right? <laughs> good morning. Welcome. And good morning, Morena. Yeah, and amen. You came in at the right time. Confirmation for the convo I just got up. Man, girl, how many times has that happened? 
you keep coming in here after a conversation you've had you're like dude this is like right on point <laughs> this is like at least the third time you've said that that's awesome good morning that's so funny i love how god works like that i really do so often i think i said this last time you said this but so often i see um i see you know something that we've just gone over in the previous week <clears throat> of our study the sermon on sunday for my church will be on or vice versa they'll have the sermon and then the next week's study <clears throat> excuse me so sorry the next week's study is on the same um, thing as the sermon and it like ties in together so often it's it's awesome so this title that said something about brewing so morning brew is about starting every day brewing over the word of god and our topic is we're in the our bible study is fearless and fruitful and the topic this week is disciplined fruit so today we are talking about discipline which is a very interesting topic but it's a very good topic and we are <clears throat> talking about that we should not be bitter about discipline from god we should take it as he is loving us enough to correct our behavior to teach us the right way to go right and we should be self-disciplined as well so that we are we are disciplined in his word we're spending time in his word and in prayer with him every day <clears throat> and um and we should absolutely be growing in our relationship with him through discipline and when he disciplines us it is for our correction it is so that we can be better in tune with him better aligned with him and grow just grow closer to him and and learn more about him and how we're called to live as followers of christ and through that we there is immense reward and immense blessing in that i'm talking about god so we are actually about to um, stop for a moment and pray before we close out our time together this morning. Um, so I'd love to pray over you guys. And at uh, 9, 11 a.m., we stop for a moment and we pray over our nation, over our world and everything that's going on. Um, so it is about to chime here in just a moment. And, and we're going to we're going to pause and pray before we close out. So if you guys would like to stop and pray with me. We are going to do that in just a second. Yep, there it is. Turn off my alarms. All right, guys, so if you want to stop and pray with me, that would be beautiful. All right. Dear Lord, thank you so much, God, for all that you do. Thank you, God, for being with us in our time this morning and guiding us through our discussion. Thank you for your correction, for your teaching, <laughs> for your instruction and your discipline. Thank you for opening our eyes and helping us to understand that, oh my gosh, that this discipline is for our good, that when you, when you discipline us, it is to correct us so that we can stay on your path and reap the blessings and the rewards and benefits of that path, your path, and not reap the consequences of going off our own way. God, help us to hear from you. Um loud and clear in this study and and help us to take it with us in our in the rest of our day as well and god i seek you out for our world for our very broken hurting world right now and everybody who is just not feeling your presence right now god i just pray that their hearts be softened and their eyes be open to you and that that all of us everybody on this planet that we just have our hearts transformed and changed to to long for you and that those who who maybe don't realize that that's what they're longing for that they that they feel that spark that they realize that their missing piece is you in their life and you in their heart and you are just waiting to just welcome them into your arms and lord help us all to just continue to seek you out harder seek you out deeper and grow in our relationship with you so that we can bear your fruit in this world share your truth and your love and your light even even further even wider god help us 
help us to navigate this crazy, just all of these crazy situations that our world is facing right now. There's so much pain, so much division, so much hate, hostility, uncertainty, and God, just heal us and help us to see what are we, what are we supposed to do, God? How do you want us to, to live and to grow? And what's the direction that you call us to go? Help us to be filled up with your spirit so that we can just pour out your love and your fruit into this world. Help us to be the change that we need to be. Help us to be changed in the way that we need to be in order to help fix our broken world and play the part that, that you are calling each of us individually to play. And Lord, I just thank you so much for all this time that we get to spend together every day. And I just, I'm so grateful that you are in control. And even when it feels like the world is just spinning out of control, you have a plan. And it's a plan that we can trust and help us all to just trust you maybe for the first time and maybe for the, <laughs> the millionth time. Let's just continue to trust you and continue to bring more people to your truth, your love, and, and a relationship with you so that we can really we can really change this world in the ways that it needs. <laughs> God help us to not be bitter. All the bitterness of our world, God, I just I just lift it all up to you and just ask you to please just lift lift that bitterness away from us and help us to have unclouded eyes, have an unclouded heart. And just really seek you out and see you and hear you and feel your presence with us and allow you to, to change us and love us and take us into your family. And Lord, just thank you so much for all the opportunities that you give us, for, for your forgiveness, for salvation that you, pray, that you paid the price so heavily for. God, thank you so much for, for your love. We don't deserve any of it, but you give it to us anyway. And Lord, I just, I'm so grateful and I just hope and pray that through our time together, uh, seeds may be planted, lives may be filled and transformed, and, and that you may speak to somebody every time that we get together. And Lord, I just thank you so much for all that you do, all that you are. In your name, amen. Okay, guys, so that is actually the end of our time today.